All right, so that's happening this week. I want to tell you a little about how Tom Doyle is here today. I think it's amazing that he's here. Last Easter, I read a story out of his book called Dreams and Visions, Is God Awakening the Muslim World? I just thought this book was the most hopeful, amazing thing about how Jesus is coming to Muslims as the man in white in their dreams. This is happening all over the world, and story after story he tells in this book. And we have a family from this church that moved from here down to New Mexico, and Tom had just been at their church recently, and she was still watching City Church online, so she saw that, so she emails me and says, you've got to meet this guy. She emails me and emails him on the same email, and you guys need to meet each other, and he's, you know, he's famous. I'm, you know, I'm thinking this will, I don't see this. He, he emails me the next day. And says, I would love to meet. I immediately wrote back and said, would you speak at our missions conference? So I got to spend tomorrow or yesterday with him. And uh, I'll tell you what, folks. He was a pastor for 20 years before God called him to be a full-time missionary to the Middle East. And what has happened since then is so supernatural. Actually, I think there should be a whole book, or there probably is, about your call, how you got called and what's been going on over there. But it is absolutely stunning. And you are going to love Tom Doyle. I don't want to take one more second away from his time. So would you welcome with me Tom Doyle? Is that on? Yes. yes. All right. Hey, great to be here. Wow, this is awesome. Let me get my some housekeeping stuff done here. Okay, we're set. Thank you, Pastor. Wow. Uh, I have loved being here already. Love your pastor, just kindred hearts. And I got to come to the mission banquet last night, and that was awesome. And can I just say you had real food there. It was so good. I'm so used to mission banquets where you have the 10-pound lasagna from Sam's, okay, frozen. And it's kind of like either scalding hot or frozen. But this was like real food. It was awesome. And the message was awesome. So thank you. It's just thrilling to be here. So I, I was born in Chicago. My dad was an FBI agent, and he fought the mafia. He was an organized crime specialist. So we lived in Chicago, Las Vegas, and New Mexico, the drug connection near the border. And that's, so that's how I grew up. But I just got to tell you something. It's fun for me to be in Wisconsin because all of the Doyles, all of our cousins, everybody in the Doyle family are lifelong Packer fans. So is that okay here? Is that okay? All right. Now, that was a little challenge for me because I was pastoring in Colorado, and I used to do chapels for the Broncos, for the Denver Broncos. And so one night we had, I think it was a Thursday night game, the Broncos and the Packers, and I took Joe Rosenberg there. We did chapel, and, and it was kind of hard to believe, but over half the stadium was Packer fans in Denver. I couldn't believe it. So if I get this right, you can't get tickets here, so you have to fly to other places to watch them. Is that right? Wow, that's crazy. That's nuts, so I love it. So I'm thrilled to be here. How many of you are tired of the bad news on television? Yeah. You know, one of the things we want to tell you today is it's time for us to stop taking our worldview from the news whether it be CNN, Fox, whoever you watch. I just want to start with this this morning, this little salvo. You'll never see it on the news. More Muslims have come to faith in Christ in the last decade than in the last 1,400 years of Islam. Isn't that amazing? And we keep saying that each year we go on because it's getting greater and greater. Amazing things are happening. We love uh, the nation of Israel, too. We work with Muslims. We work with Jews. Um, we should do a trip to Israel. Pastor, let's do a trip to Israel. I'm a, I'm a guide in Israel, so shocking. I've been there 71 times. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, my eye doctor's in Israel. We're there so much, so we love it. Go on Bible tours, get to see Jews that love Jesus, Palestinians that love Jesus, both of them that love each other. And the only way that works is if they reconcile with the Father. So we can't reconcile these splits, all of these things, religion, racism, and all that, until we reconcile with the Father. Once we do that, then we're all on the same page. And so it's happening around the Middle East, and 
It's kind of crazy that I would become a missionary. I mean, I was a pastor 20 years. We didn't even get it right in our house to begin with. We have six children, three boys and three girls. And um, it was Good Friday in Texas years ago when the kids were little. And um, we had a dog, Coco. And Coco escaped during the Good Friday service that I was doing. It's a very somber service. And so we're doing that. And Coco, our dog, escaped. And we didn't know it, but he got in the neighbor's backyard. He's always getting out. And and fell in their pool and drowned. Yeah, so it was bad. Coco, his little poofy thing, you know. And um, so he came back. The neighbors called us. It, it was, kids were so horrified, you know, like throwing themselves on the lawn and stuff. It was bad. You know, I lost Coco. Well, it's Good Friday. And so all of a sudden, Lindsay is four and says, well, what happens to dogs when they die? And I thought, well, this is the perfect opportunity to go over the gospel again with her because it's important. So we talk about Coco died, and, but then what happens when you die and, and it's Good Friday and all this, we bring it together. And amazingly, Lindsay prays to receive Jesus as her savior. A bad thing, God took it and made it good. And so it's Saturday, we thought. We thought she understood it, okay? So it's Sunday morning, resurrection day, walking in and my my wife, Joanne, used to put bows on the girls' hair that were, like, bigger than their head, you know. So here's Lindsay, and we're walking in. And I said to the chairman of Deacons, uh, I said, Lindsay, tell Dawn what happened to you this weekend, the good news. And she said, yes, I asked Coco to be my savior. <laughs> and I went, Lindsay, Coco, no. And she, but she went on. And have you ever noticed that when you put kids on the spot? It's their opportunity to burn you big time. You know, they, they are waiting for that moment. And she said, yes, Coco died for my sins on the cross. I said, Lindsay, no. I know Coco died on Good Friday, and Jesus did, but it's not Coco, honey. It's Jesus. And she goes, you know, I always get those two mixed up. <laughs> So, I don't think we were all that much of a candidate for missions, right? Not even getting it straight in our house. But God worked it out. She loves the Lord. She went with YWAM to Pakistan. She's awesome. But anyway, God started to move. Well, I have good news for you today from the Middle East. It's, there's difficult things, but there are good things happening. Do you know that Muslim background believers, do you know what an MBB is? Muslim background believer. Do you know that... Those that have been polled around the world, at least one third of them had a dream about Jesus before they came to Christ. It's awesome. So I, I grew up in, uh, I was Catholic, then, it'd be, then I, I found Christ. A lot of people do in the Catholic Church. I was on kind of the work system myself. I came to Christ and very conservative college, Bible seminary. So I didn't know that stuff happened. We sh certainly weren't looking for it. And just a tidal wave of Muslims that we met that had significant high definition dreams about Jesus that they couldn't shake. And so don't get me wrong. Nobody goes to bed a Muslim has a dream and voila, I'm a believer, wakes up. It doesn't happen that way, but they are just uh, overwhelmed. They have to find out what does this mean? And, and, and they start to seek and they want to get a Bible and they look for believers. They may get online and things start to happen and they come to faith in Christ. And so one third of them are having dreams. And um, I think about this, I, I think about how the heart of God, it's not God's will that any should perish. He wants all of us to come to the knowledge of the truth. But what do you do when 86% of Muslims, and that's one fifth of the world, 86% of them do not know one believer? What's he gonna do? And I wonder at times if God's saying, hey, I've equipped you, I've called you, I've given the Great Commission. If you're not willing, I'll do it myself. I'll shake them up myself. And so it's, it's happening. And when it happens, when Muslims come to faith in Christ, look out world. Man, they are committed. They are willing to die for Jesus. And um, it, it's awesome what God is doing with their life. So let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, because Muslims that come to faith in Christ and risk it all remind me of the church in Thessalonica in the first century. 1 Thessalonians 1 and verses 4 and 5. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. This is real tender language here, because our God 
uh, our gospel came to you simply, not simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit, with deep conviction. And you know how we lived among you. And so the gospel just burst on the scene. Paul comes to Thessalonica, you know, Acts 17, three Sabbaths, three Shabbats. He's there. A church starts, persecution starts, a riot starts. The gospel never comes in quietly. I've heard people say, well, my faith is a private thing. Well, I've never seen that in the Middle East. It's not private. Everybody knows, your family knows, the Philippian jailer, you know, believe in your heart and your whole family will be saved. It's going to spread. It's going to go. And so the gospel bursts on the scene. And so today, we have the Islamic State. And I just wrote a new book. Maybe you can jot this down, but it's coming out Easter, and it's called Standing in the Fire. And it's courageous Christians living by faith in frightening times. Right there, among ISIS, in the middle of it. Three of them are former terrorists that have come to faith in Christ. Man, when the gospel transforms someone, it doesn't hold back. So recently, my friend in Syria, his name is Farid. We're going to try to call him later. He's our Syrian director. We're going to let you have a conversation with him if it goes through and all of that, okay? Farid told me that there was a man that came to church. In the past. It's an above-ground church in Syria. A lot of them are underground, but it was an above-ground church. And there's the pastor preaching, looks out in the crowd, there's a lot, people are desperate, and Muslims are starting to peek in and try to figure out what's going on. And this man is sitting in the middle of the crowd, and the pastor looks at him and goes, I know this guy, he is a known terrorist, and he is with the Islamic State. What is he doing in my church? So he's preaching, and he keeps noticing this guy here, and he's dressed like, you know, the typical terrorist with that outfit on, and... He's doing the sermon and watching and, and just, okay, Lord, I'm going to just go for it. I'm going to preach the gospel. This guy probably is here to hurt me or kill me. And then he ends up giving an invitation. People get up. The man gets up and gets in the line and starts moving toward him. This pastor used to be a boxer. He boxed for Syria and was really good. And he started thinking, okay, when I get up, do I defend myself? When he comes, he's coming toward me. What do I do? Jesus, you show me. And finally, it's the time. And the man comes up to him face to face and he looks at him and he says, you know why I'm here? The Islamic State sent me to kill you, but I want to receive Jesus. And the pastor embraced him and said, how in the world did that happen? He said, well, I've been seeing Jesus. And he said, did you see him in a dream? And he said, no, I didn't. I've seen him in the lives of the believers in Syria that love us no matter what. And the Bible people are the only ones that we can trust. They don't want anything from you. They just love you. And I had nothing but hate in my heart, and I wanted that love. So this guy's name is Muhammad. Pray for him. He's with the Islamic State. He's got a big bullseye on his back now. These are believers coming to faith in Christ that are willing to die for their faith, just like the believers in Thessalonica. So I have a friend, and he lives in Iraq, and his name is Michael. Michael used to drive a tank for Saddam Hussein before he was saved. He was the bad dude, comes to faith in Christ, changes. He is sharing the gospel with everyone. He just is, he's just an evangelist. He just is so filled up. Now, this is not America. This is Iraq. This gets your brains blown out there, but he doesn't care. He wants to share the gospel. And his best friend is Hisham. He actually grew up next to him, and his house was next door, and he's a Muslim, practicing Muslim. So Michael starts on Hisham. And he's sharing with him, sharing with him. Every time he's with him, he's sharing. And finally, after two years, Hasham says, okay, Michael, I'm pretty sick of all of this. I mean, I'm a Muslim. You obviously love Jesus, but I'm tired of all these conversations moving to Jesus. Anytime we talk about anything, soccer, the weather, all of a sudden, it's Jesus, and I'm sick of it. So here's what we'll do. Here's the deal. Give me a New Testament. I'll read through it, and I'm going to tell you where the mistakes are, because I know it's being corrupted. We've learned that. And our religion. I'll find the mistakes and I'll come back to you and then I'll talk to you about Islam. And he said, okay. So he gives them uh, a Bible, gives them a New Testament, Arabic New Testament. Hisham takes it 
And about like six weeks, uh, or yeah, three weeks later, uh, Michael gets a call late at night. Hello, Michael, this is Hisham. And he said, hi, how are you doing? And he said, well, not so good. I have a big problem. And he said, okay, what's the problem? And he said, I read the New Testament. And he said, well, that's a good thing. He goes, no, here's the problem. I think I'm falling in love with Jesus. <laughs> okay, that's good. And he goes, but... I'm a Muslim. I can't go there. So give me the Old Testament because I know the Jews are very clever and they've changed things. I'm sure they've switched things. I'm going to read the Old Testament, come back to you. Then we'll have her talk. I'll talk to you about Islam. He said, okay, Arabic Old Testament takes it. And he doesn't even take two months. Late at night again, Michael gets a call. Hey, Michael, it's Hisham. I, I got a bigger problem. Okay, what's the problem? And he goes, I read the Old Testament and the Jews could not have written it on their own. God had to write it with them. The Jews didn't just, so all I've been taught about that the Jews wrote this on their own, corrupt can't be. God wrote it with them. And he goes, really? Okay, why do you say that? And he goes, if the Jews had written the Old Testament on their own by themselves, they would have made themselves look a whole lot better. <laughs> I think that's pretty insightful. And he said, but I got a problem. I'm a Muslim. I can't go there. And I'm smart enough to see that there's prophecies about Jesus over 700 years before. He gave him a study Bible. Before that. Micah 5.2, born in Bethlehem. Some of the words that he would say where he would live. Isaiah 53, his very words on the cross. Man, I got a big problem so I'm going to pray and fast for 30 days and ask Jesus, are you truly God or not? Think about that commitment, guys. Heard the gospel two years, New Testament, Old Testament. He's going to pray and fast for 30 days. And on day 26, this time in the middle of the night, Michael gets the call and it's Hisham. And he says, Michael, it's Hisham. I don't have any more problems. And he said, what do you mean? He said, it's Jesus. He came to me in a vision. And he told me how much he loves me. And, and he put his arm around me and he said, Hisham, come and follow me. I love you. I died for you. And he said, I want to receive Jesus. And so that night on a roof in Baghdad, in the middle of the war, Hisham comes to faith in Christ. Michael leads him, a former tank driver for Saddam Hussein. You know what Hisham does today? He's a pastor in the underground church in Iraq. Yeah. Last summer, he got shot in the head by terrorists, and we thought we'd lost him. We got calls, put out the word, people, and uh, he, he survived, and he's, he's back out. He's sharing the gospel. God is moving. The gospel bursts on the scene. It doesn't come quietly, but listen, folks, we got to realize this. Um, that's not just stuff we're hearing in the Middle East. The Muslims are coming. The Muslims are coming. The Muslims are here. The Muslims are here. You know, it's the largest Muslim state in the union right now, Texas. They're coming to Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston. They get jobs. They're here. And God has called us to reach them. But if we're afraid of them or if we hate them or if we're suspicious of every one of them, we won't have God's heart. We won't reach out to them. Now, do we have security problems? We do. And we're praying the government sharpens and has better screening because this would be the perfect storm for ISIS to come in. But I really think we as believers are oftentimes guilty of defaulting over to the government saying, hey, fix the Muslim problem. We're called to reach him with the gospel, right? But we've got to have a heart for them. So years ago in the 90s, I'm pastoring, had to go back and get my car in Denver. We lived in Colorado Springs. Work was being done. Joanne drops me off, go to get the car. They said, there's more work to be done. We're sorry that you drove all the way up here. So why don't you go across the street? There's a nice restaurant and we'll pay for it. Just get some lunch. And so, so I went over, I'd been to Israel several times. And so I'm just sitting there having a falafel and a diet Pepsi, loving life, you know, it's free. And two men come in, two Arabs and sit at a table this close to me. And they have black leather jackets, closely cropped beards, and they're whispering in Arabic. And I'm listening in, you know, I mean, FBI son, we know these things, right? I'm on it. I'm on it. We know what's happening here. These are terrorists. Of course they are. State Capitol up the street. It's all falling into place, right? And they're talking, whispering in Arabic. And all of a sudden, one of them says, well, the Lord is moving in Syria. 
in English. And I thought, what? Can't be. Back to Arabic, whispering. And then all of a sudden, one breaks out in English, says louder, Jesus is Lord over the Middle East, isn't he? And I just looked over and I said, are you guys believers? And they said, yes, are you? And I said, I think so. <laughs> I mean, I was when I came in here. I'm not so sure anymore. I mean, what a major error, right? They are terrorists. No, actually, Tom, they're brothers in Christ, you know. But that was my own looking through the news. I mean, all of them are, right? That's how it is. Man, when the gospel comes in, it shakes up a culture, an individual, a village, a town, a city. Look at verse 6, just like it happened in Thessalonica. You became imitators of us and of the Lord and you welcomed us in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Severe suffering, the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't necessarily put that together if I was writing that book, but it's true. It's true. There is joy in the midst of suffering, and the disciples were, were excited that they were counted worthy to suffer for Jesus uh, in his name. So, pastor, 20 years, God calls us to leave. It's June of, of 2001. Three months later, 9-11 happens. And uh, I mean, everybody's freaking out. You're going to the Middle East. Are you kidding me? Why are you going? I got everything. You, you have six kids. Are you being responsible? You're an American. You're a Christian. You're going to go reach Muslims. They're going to kill you. One guy just said, you're stupid. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And that was my dad that said that. But, <laughs> but you you know, I'm getting that kind of stuff. And so I go a couple months after 9-11, my first mission trip, and we're going to Israel, but we're going to work in the Gaza Strip with the only evangelical church among 1.5 million Muslims. So I'm on the plane, and I got Voice of the Martyrs magazine, and I'm reading it. I love Voice of the Martyrs. We do speaking for them sometimes. And so I'm reading it. No joke. It says, the Gaza Strip is the most dangerous place on the planet right now for believers. And I thought, dang it, couldn't I got this like a week before? <laughs> I got it right on the way to the plane. I pulled it out of the mailbox. And so go there. We get into Gaza City, get through the Aras Crossing. And we haven't been there very long, like half an hour. And um, massive people, and they're all Muslim in, in the downtown Gaza City. And a Muslim woman comes up to me covered in black, and she runs up and just like grabs my forearm. And I was shocked because they won't sp speak to you. You know, that'd be forbidden. But she grabbed my arm and said, you're from America, aren't you? And I said, well, yeah, I am. And she said, I could tell by the color of your eyes said, oh, okay. And she said, did you see on September 11th, spoke perfect English. Did you see on September 11th when the, when the buildings came down and, and CNN showed Gaza and the people were cheering and celebrating? Did you see that? I said, well, I, I mean, I did. And she said, well, not me. I was crying for those people because that was wrong and they didn't deserve to die. And I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for you. I'm sorry for America. Please forgive us. I'm so sorry. She tapped her heart and she turned and walked away. And I thought, Lord, there's human beings in the Gaza Strip. There's people created in the image of God. So Hussein is a new believer. He's a former Muslim and, and we're with him and some other guys. And he goes, Hey, listen, why don't we do this? Why don't we go down to Yasser Arafat's mosque? It just got, uh, all the buildings around it got bombed by the Israelis because they were shooting rockets out in Israel, retaliating. The people are there. They're kind of down. Let's just go share Jesus at the mosque. This is day one as a missionary, okay? Okay, so let's go. So we went down, Hussein and me, a couple other Muslim background believers. I'm the white guy. And uh, so there we are, and we're visiting, and people are wanting to talk to us and take pictures and, and that. And all of a sudden, um, Hussein just said, hey, Tom, you know, uh, this is illegal what we're doing. We could get arrested for it. But hey, really, I mean, every believer should go to jail at least once for their faith, don't you think? <laughs> and I said... Yeah, I mean, sure. So, um, but they're interested and we're going on. And, and, but then about 20 to 30 minutes later, the conversation changes because the long beards, the skull caps, the white dish dashes, the clerics, the imams, the sheikhs, some of them show up and they crowd around us and there's finger pointing and there's anger and they're pulling out the Quran and this is getting hostile. And Hussein pulls me back and says, uh, hey, Tom, if this really goes bad, I mean, they could kill us. It's the Gaza Strip. 
but I'm ready to die for Jesus. And you're a missionary, you're ready to die for Jesus, aren't you? <laughs> I said, well, yes, I mean, I mean, do you mean like right now? Is that what you mean? And uh, here's the thought that went through my head. What a short missionary career. You know, really, it's his first day, never came back. And, um, but survived, obviously, right? And, uh, but I get in a plane and go home till I can go back a month later. He lives there and he is courageous and he is willing to die for Jesus. And so the question is, can young believers survive persecution? We don't survive it, we thrive in it. When you try to wipe out the church, we spread. When dictators and religions say we're going to cut them all off, we're going to get rid of Christianity, we grow, we thrive. The Ayatollah came in in 79 and said, we're going to squash the church. We become the Islamic Republic of Iran, and there'll never be two religions here. We will crush Christianity. And maybe there were 5,000 believers at that point. Do you know what's happened today? There's one to two million believers in Iran. It is the fastest growing church per capita in the world. Isn't that amazing? Give God a hand. We think the Ayatollahs in Iran are some of the greatest evangelists of the day. They've driven more people away from Islam into the arms of Jesus because they're sick of what they're being forced to live under and do. And, and the gospel is thriving. You know what the second fastest growing church per capita is in the world? Afghanistan. So we think, man, that'd be the worst place to be a believer. But in reality, it's the best place. Yes, your lives are on the line, but Jesus is there. Man, he's standing in the fire with them. And nowhere did we see that more than when we went to see the 21 martyr wives in Egypt that were killed by ISIS on the Libya beach. And I think we may have a picture. I didn't do the PowerPoint, but maybe you can find that picture. Um, and uh, we went and visited them, took 2,000 letters of thanks and love and blessing to them, to these uh, widows' wives. So did you remember that story? So it was ISIS in the big black suits, uh, the, the believers in the orange jumpsuits, and they're walking on the beach in Libya, and they killed them. And when I first saw that, I was horrified because I watched that on, it was ABC when I saw it, and I thought, I know what's coming. We know what they're going to do. And then I heard this story, and I remember I was horrified. Fast forward, Joanne and I go to those villages and bring 2,000 letters to the martyr wives. And the first woman that we met was Takia, 20 years old, one-year-old daughter. And this is what she said to us. It's so hard not having my husband. And the reason he came back from Libya was to come and meet Takia. She was born when he was working on the oil fields in Libya. So he never got to meet her. And that's a sad thing to me. But she said, think about this, Tom and Joanne. How is it that I am so privileged to have a martyr for Christ in my family? I'm in a village that nobody's heard of. I don't even read. But yet God gave us the highest honor on earth to have someone in our family, my husband, die for Jesus. And let me tell you, we went to encourage them. We sat at their feet. We sat and learned from them. And I got a transformation in my thinking, and it's this. There they are. And the transformation is this. Revelation 12, 11 said, and they conquered him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. They did not love life more than death. They were captive 45 days. The enemy threw everything at them they could. They didn't bend. They didn't break. They didn't convert to Islam. That is a victory, not a loss. We're not victims. We are victors. Amen. Maybe. Is it okay? Can you go forward? Do you mind going forward? Let's see if we can see Takiya one more. One more. There she is, 20 years old. Let me tell you, I don't know how to say it other than this. I felt like I was in the presence of royalty. The wisdom that this young woman had, a martyr wife. There's her daughter holding the letters that we brought to encourage them. They encouraged us. The church doesn't survive in persecution. It thrives. It goes into overdrive. The gospel spreads. I believe persecuted believers are a model for all of us. Look at verse 7. Um, and you became a model to all believers in Macedonia 
and Achaia. Believers are, are being watched and, and Fareed in um, Syria. If, if you get the book Killing Christians, he's in chapter two and the graveyard's still empty. Here's what's going on in Syria. Believers are being crucified on crosses. A year ago on Easter, on Good Friday, seven young Muslims had come to faith in Christ. ISIS found them and they said, you wanna live like Jesus? You'll die like Jesus. On Good Friday, we're gonna crucify you on crosses unless you recant and come back to the religion of Islam. All seven of them in their 20s said, we're not. We're not leaving Jesus. We're not going to deny him. They were crucified on crosses on Good Friday. Those are the kind of things that are happening. So Fareed, who we write about, and is our national leader in Syria. He's the Syria leading the Syrian, leading the Syrian teams there, seeing people come to faith in Christ. And it's it's enormous. It's, it's in the thousands that they've seen come to Christ. Underground church is spreading. Jesus is the answer in Syria. And it ends up that um, it was so dangerous at that point in Syria. Fareed called his 10 leaders together and said, you know, um, maybe we'll die here. And so I want to give you the option to leave. You have children and wives and we're all young so we're not trying to be heroes here, but one of these days the borders will be closed. If you want to leave Syria, go. So let's take a week and fast. And if you want to go, go. But if you want to stay, meet back here in a week. And so a week later, he comes back to an underground place in the Damascus area, reaches for the doorknob, and the thought went through his mind, you know, I wonder if anybody's even going to be here. I mean, this is Syria. There were, there were 92 bombs that dropped in Damascus just one day. How can you raise a family in that? And so he opens the door, and there weren't five of his leaders there. There weren't 10. There were 25. They'd gone out and recruited 15 more. And they stood as one and said, we're staying and we're prepared to die in Syria. And so you know what they did? They went out because many of them are former Muslims. There's no place for them to be buried. They bought some land for a graveyard so they can bury each other when they die for Jesus in Syria. Fareed sends uh, communications from Syria. It has to be a little bit cryptic. And sometimes he'll say, um, he is moving. Uh, we have many new friends. People are coming to faith in Christ. And then they'll always end, oh, and the good news is this, the graveyard's still empty. Praise God. So in a minute, we're going to try to call him, and we want you to be able to just hear what's going on in his life. So let's show uh, a short video right now, okay, if we can. What is it, how does this relate to you? Let's watch this. Islam is very hard for Muslim women. There's no love and acceptance and mercy and grace. That's why they go to the mosque, they pray five times a day, they fast, they do everything they know right to do. But Muslims are dying every day without knowing the true Jesus. So when you look at a Muslim, consider this, that they are blinded. They have not seen the true light of Jesus. God has come to set them free and to put love in them. If you can reach them with the gospel message, you can change their life. You can give them hope for their dying soul. My view of Muslim women before Not Forgotten was uh, they don't want you to come near them. That's why they have that burqa on, stay away. When I just saw them in their burqa, I just thought of them as very radical. At first, I thought, that's silly. I don't do that, you know, but um, it is a subconscious thing. They're dangerous. 9-11 figures hugely into my thinking. Um, you know, there's a fear. There's a huge group of Muslim girls at my university that I've never talked to, <clears throat> ever. I just left them alone, didn't want to have anything to do with them had really no interest. They were the enemy in a sense. Even though, I, I mean, even though I knew there were people behind those, it still felt like they might be the enemy that could hurt my family. Women are taught at a young age if they do something wrong, even if it's not their fault, let's say they're raped or molested or something like that terrible happens to them, if that's discovered, they're the ones that are blamed for that. 
the stories, they're terrible. They're, I mean, they're terrifying and heartbreaking because women have been not just abused physically, not just raped, not just the things that we experience here, but those things have happened to them in a culture where if they tell anyone, then they have dishonored their entire family. So that the veil is on the outside, but the veil trapping all those secrets and darkness as well, I mean, that's just, just as painful. So they learn at a young age that they have no value. They don't have a voice. Their place is back in the shadows. Their hearts, it's like the brick wall just being laid up. And behind that wall is the real woman, but there's no way to get to her without Jesus bringing those bricks down. So how do we reach into the hearts of those women that have so shut down? How do we give those women a voice? First of all, I've learned that we have to be transparent with our own hearts, with our own lives. Initially, they're kind of like, I can't believe they're talking about this. We don't do this in our society. But then empathy kind of enters in and those defenses start dropping. The tears come from their eyes. They start leaning in. They want to hear what happened to us. I can't tell you how many times I have heard a woman say to me, I've never told this to anyone in my life, but this is what happened to me. And they'll start sharing their story. One of the girls asked to speak to me alone. She said that when she was younger, she was abused at the hands of somebody that still lives in her village. She said, because after what's happened to me, when I marry, I could be killed if this is found out. So she lives in fear of the person that she was abused at the hands of. Then she lives in fear of her future because she could be killed. And she has no hope. So what's been hidden in the darkness that Satan keeps them in bondage with, as soon as it comes out into the light, of course, Jesus comes in and starts healing that. He starts healing them. And they realize that they have been set free. When I went to the Not Forgotten event, it just triggered my heart that I need to step out in action. Just seeing how much the women here love that you engage with them and even just talking to them and smiling at them. And especially when you do the foot washing, it just breaks down walls and they just start weeping and crying. And they just, no one's ever loved them that way. I just saw these women so differently. Um, we, we met with them in their homes and we saw them without their burkas on and they had these gorgeous dresses on, these beautiful things, and they were beautiful women. I just have this sense of urgency that we need more people to join us. There are so many people that don't know Jesus out there, and we have the hope within us. We've got the message, and if we're not going to tell them, who's going to? We need you, because Jesus is coming back soon, and these people need to hear the gospel so that they will not go into eternity without Jesus. They were really amazing. They touched my heart as a Christian, so imagine as a Muslim, women really neglected how it really impacts their hearts reach out to these Muslim women let me teach you how to love them and not be afraid of them so that you can be the one to have the privilege of leading a Muslim to Christ why not share with these women <coughs> find ways to bring them into your homes find ways to to talk to them in the stores and make friends with them he loves those women behind those veils he does <laughs> so why can't I Good question, huh? Amen. All right. So I just got a text from Farid Asad. Let me just set this up for you. Um, we got a lot of Packer fans here. If Aaron Rodgers came in this morning, we'd wonder what the heck he's doing here. But also we would say, you're at church. Oh, my gosh. You're supposed to be at a game. Wow, this is awesome. And he would get the biggest cheers. This is bigger than that. The guy we're calling, this is the Apostle Paul of Syria. He has recently 30 death threats spray painted on the front of his house. I asked him, Farid, how do you know there's 30 death threats? He said, they spray painted, they numbered them. On the, we're going to kill you. This is what we'll do to your wife. This is your family. Amazing. God is using him to reach people in Syria. So I'm going to call him and then say, Farid, are you there? Yes. And then I'm going to put him on and say, hey, Farid, we have some friends that want to say hello. Would you guys cheer and go nuts for him? Would you do that? Okay. All right. Is this on? Can I put it up to this? Put it up. Is this, is this one on? It is? Okay. All right. I'm dialing. Okay. 
And I had to bring my battery charger up here. My phone is falling apart. Okay. Whenever the new one comes out, they have a self-destruct on your phone. <laughs> That's what I think. Okay. So maybe he's, see if he's there and then I'll introduce him. Fareed, are you there? Okay, okay. Hey, listen, Fareed, we have some friends here in City Church, Madison, Wisconsin. They want to say hello to you. Consider that a big hug, Fareed. What do you think about that? Thank you very much. And I hope one day that we will all together with the same, all the eternity together in heaven. Be together in heaven. Amen. Well, listen. Amen. So we've been telling them stories about what God's doing in your home country. And in the midst of the worst humanitarian crisis, maybe even since World War I now, God's moving. Do you want to share anything that, that uh, you can share something briefly? And then just we're going to pray for you. So any, any good news that you can bring us? Yes. You know, the, the time now in Syria is so difficult and many things happen. But in this all the, uh, the news we, we uh, maybe you heard about Syria, God, God worked there and many, many people from uh, Muslim background, they come to Jesus. And we can speak about thousands of people, they come to Jesus and Amen. Jesus as a savior for their life. Um, I ask you, uh, please pray for all these new believers who come to Jesus. Because of all these people, they, they start to look for hope. Mm -hmm. They didn't find this hope in their religion. Now this is uh, our uh, time to work between this kind of people and thank God many, many, many people from them come to Jesus. Amen. That is awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Only God. Only God could do that. For Reed, this is a praying church, and we just, what's the number one prayer request? How can we pray for you and your team? Yeah, uh, please pray, pray for, for our leaders when they are moving between the villages and for uh, safety for them and their uh, families from kidnapped or help or uh, mm -hmm. any dangerous around. That's number one. Okay, you know what? We're going to do that right now as a church, okay? So we're going to ask everybody to just stand and kind of point toward the phone as a gesture toward you, and we're going to pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you've not given up on Syria, that you love this country, that you are sending servants like Fareed and this team that has so much love for all the people groups here that they are coming to faith in Christ. Most people are trying to leave, but Jesus, you're going there. And that just shows your love and your passion for all lost people in the world. So we pray for Fareed, his wife, his family, for the leaders, for their wives and families. Lord, would you protect them? And Lord, we thank you. Fareed never asked for protection for his, himself, but for his team and for his family. And so we, we just stand with him and pray for that protection. Lord, we know that angels are around. They are like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. They wouldn't be alive if you weren't standing there with them, Lord Jesus. So we thank you. And this is a high privilege for us to just join hands with our brothers and sisters in Syria. Yeah. And show them how much we love you, love you and love them. And Lord, we just say amen. Come, Lord Jesus, reach Syria, bring all of the people groups together, rallied around the Lord Jesus Christ. And we look forward to that day, and we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Fareed, we love you, dear brother. God bless you. Thank you. I love you.
Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Let me close. Wow. That's like the best it's ever been. That was awesome. Thank you, guys. Okay. So what do we do with all of this? Muslims are coming to faith in Christ. Persecution is up. Hey, by the way, when you see harvest throughout our 2,000 years, you know what always goes with it as an identical twin persecution. When there's a great revival of harvest, there's persecution. It's like they're identical twins, and so it's happening. So what do I do? Well, how do I close this? How do we land this plane and take some action items home? Number one, God's calling us to stand with believers in prison, persecution, and danger. We may not be called to suffer in America, although it may be coming, but we're called to stand together with our believers like Fareed, like you did. It's a great start to love them in Jesus' name and put our arms around them. Paul said, if one of us hurts, we all suffer, right? And this is not anything to do with us. So when you see us targeted on the media, don't take it personally, Christians. We're the scum of the earth in America. We're the problems with them. It's the war on Jesus. Jesus said, they're going to hate you. Why? Because they hate me. This is what it's about. So let's stand with believers in in prison, persecution, and danger. How many of you guys have Facebook? Raise your hands, okay? Okay, this is church, so you can't lie. So raise. Oh, we've got a few more. Okay, all right. So we started a Facebook uh, page. It's called 838, number 830 spelled out. Look at that. They pulled it up. There it is, 838. We set our watches or phones at 838 p.m. every single night. And pray for believers in prison, persecution, and danger. Why 8.38 p.m.? For Romans 8.38 and 39. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. We want to say that verse as a blessing for people like Fareed and stand with our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world that are suffering. So if you will like this page, you're going to join join an army of 19,500 <clears throat> people who are praying, excuse me, every day. And when there's requests from the front lines, you get them in real time on your phone, on your computer, wherever you are, and you can pray. You can even dialogue sometimes with them so we as a body can come to faith, come together in faith and pray for each other in, in dangerous places, okay? That's number one. Two, ask yourself the two questions. The two questions that believers ask Muslims before they pray to receive Christ, like the man that came forward from the Islamic State, the pastor had to be honest with them. We have to ask. The two questions are this: these. Are you willing to suffer for Jesus? Muslims have to rate, reason that out because it could happen in their family. Their family could be so shamed they might persecute them, might kill them. And then secondly, are you willing to die for Jesus? Those are the two diagnostic questions that Muslims are asked before they come to faith in Christ. I was a pastor for 20 years. You know what? We never asked those in the new members class. That would have thinned the ranks. Are you kidding me? I think I'll go to that church. They're less strict, you know? Man, are we willing to suffer? Are we willing to be persecuted? Three, pray for God's heart for lost people. If we're afraid of Muslims or we're angry or we hate them, will never reach out to them with God's love. Jesus said, by this all men will know you are my disciples, if what? You have love. That is our spiritual identification bracelet, and they can pick it up like that man with the Islamic State that sensed the love and wanted Jesus. That's it. So pray for God's heart. Four, become desperate. Uh, many people praying for those in the Middle East and around the world and global conditions, all these things happening, get down on their face to pray. Do you know Apple did not invent FaceTime? They didn't. Believers have been doing it for centuries when they were desperate. When the Assyrians were going to attack Hezekiah, laid out the letter in the temple steps, and he got down before God. God, here's our plan. We have no plan. And if you don't come through, we're toast. And that's exactly the kind of spirit we need to have for our country, before the elections, for those that are lost, for those in the Middle East, become desperate. So I'll close with this. We moved after 20 years of living in Colorado and commuting back to the Middle East to Dallas, Texas. That's where our ministry headquarters are. We lived at 7,500 feet in Colorado, cool, shorts in the summer, maybe a sweatshirt, it's getting kind of cold, you know. 
to Dallas, Texas. It's like 180 in July and humid, you know? And so I'm there and it was first summer there, and I had been in the office, and it was a long day, and I, and I just didn't seem to get anything done. And I, I, I don't know what happened to this day. I got in the car, got to go pick up Joanne for dinner with some friends, but it's way across town. I'm going to be late. There's traffic. I get up on the freeway, and I see on the gauge it says six miles till empty. I just went, oh, man, are you kidding? Oh, okay, Lord, I got to get off. And so I get off, and there's, there's three gas stations. I'll take this one. It's Fina. I'll take this pump. And I stuck my card in, and it said, must see cashier. So can I just say I wasn't exactly in the spirit at that point? Can I just, could we talk about that? And so I, I walked in put down my card, and the woman comes up. She's from the Middle East. She's Muslim, and we start talking, and I said to her, wow, you're from the Middle East. I love your people. I go there all the time. Where are you from? And she goes, you visit the Middle East all the time? I said, most of the year we're in the Middle East, and she goes, well, you'll have to guess where I'm from. I said, oh, okay, Egypt. She said, nope, Saudi Arabia. I said, really? You're from Saudi Arabia? You're Muslim? Yes. Wow, that's amazing. And getting ready to leave, and I said, you know, I'm a writer, and I write books, and I wrote this book. It's I mean, it's this weird thing. I'm sure you never heard about it, but your people are having dreams about Jesus. And I, I wrote a book called Dreams and Visions. I'd love to give you one. And she said, you wrote about Muslims dreaming of Jesus? And I said, yes. And she said, I've been having dreams about Jesus. I said, excuse me a minute. Forgive me, God, for that crack. I get it now. I, I see why I'm here. It's not about my schedule, right? And so I walk out and get a book. I handed it to her and took off, and we weren't even late for dinner. You know. Two days later, I'm out of gas, and I thought, oh, wow, I'm going to stop by FINA. And then I drive up, and I thought, oh, I'm going to use that same pump. Stuck it in, card worked fine. See, I don't think it was a card malfunction. It was an order from God. It didn't say, please see cashier. It said, must see cashier. <laughs> okay. So I went in, and there's where we are reading the book, and she goes, this is my life. And I said, what do you mean your life? You've had dreams for a while? And she said, I've been having Jesus visitations for over 40 years now. I said, Rawia, didn't you ever talk to anyone, a Christian, stop at a church? And she said, plenty of times, but... I think they were afraid of me because I was a Muslim. Nobody seemed to, like, want to talk to me. But I, I just knew this. Jesus, in these dreams, put his arm around me, told me how much he loved me, and I knew if he loved me so much, one of these days he was coming for me. And I'd understand, and I said, today is that day. I think today is that day. And I shared the gospel, and she was willing, and we held hands in the Fina gas station on Bush Freeway in Coit in Dallas, Texas, and she received Jesus, and it was glorious. Yay, God, huh? And she loves him today. Why do I tell that story? Because I was being an idiot that day. My schedule, my thing, Lord, I'm serving, I'm a missionary. And here's this lady over 40 years. Listen, folks, the Muslims are coming, the Muslims are coming, the Muslims are here. How many Rawiyas are here in Madison, in Wisconsin, in areas that you see? Show them that you recognize them. Bring them the love of Christ. They are ready. They are willing. More of them have come to faith in Christ in the last decade than the last 1,400 years. Let's go get them. God bless you. Thanks for letting me be here. Could we, could we stand together? I want to encourage you to stop by Tom's book table right out in the foyer there. Um, and I want to say this. He was easy on the second service. Because in the first service, he explained to us the two idols of the American church. Comfort and safety. And in the first service, um, Jesus, Jesus, we don't need to feel guilty that we're here and they're there and that they're suffering and their every day is difficult and hard. That's not what Jesus is after, but he is after this, guys. Here's how we can identify with our family, our brothers and sisters. It's time that we lay down 
our need for comfort and safety and put it at the cross. It's, it's time to stop making the goal of our life not having to do anything hard or being afraid that we're going to suffer in some way. Guys, it's, it's, it's time. It, it's time. Would you, would you just join me? Lord, we love you today. We love you today, Jesus. And Lord, wherever we've been to this point, whatever the diagnostic questions are that we came to Christ with, we want to answer these two today. Jesus, we are willing. Holy Spirit, make us willing to suffer and even die for Jesus Christ. Lord, let our comfort be in the Holy Spirit. Let our joy even be in the midst of suffering. And Father, I pray when our lives are inconvenienced and we are trying to get to our thing and it says must see cashier, God, I just pray we'd remember this story. That there are people that need us. There are people that are experiencing things in their life that they don't understand, and it's your drawing them, and they're waiting for somebody to tell them what's going on. So God, would you help us to stop being afraid? Stop being afraid. Lord, take our idols of comfort and safety away, and let us, each one of us, make you our hiding place. You are our refuge. Lord, thank you that even to this day, that graveyard is empty <laughs> that they bought. That you are, if you could protect them in Syria, when they are, they've got death threats on their house, I think you can protect us here. So, Father, no more fear. No more living to be safe. We want to burn even here, Jesus. Help us, God, we pray. Lord, thank you for Tom. We are so honored and privileged that you would send him here to be with us today. Amazing, God. Thank you for stirring our hearts. Th we needed this. And not just us here, but by, by video stream, everybody that got to hear this message today. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.